Building a profitable business off scale is one of the hardest things you can do. Now, I've built a pretty big business. I've got over a thousand staff. We're doing millions in revenue each and every single year. And there's really seven tools and tactics that I use to help me to be effective in running those businesses. They're golden nuggets that I want you to swipe and deploy so that you can use them in your business to be more profitable and actually stay in the game. Most foul, and I don't want you to foul. I don't want you just to survive. I actually want you to thrive. Let's get into it. These ideas are tried, tested, and proven. I'm actually doing them myself right now, so I know that they work. You know, when you've got a big business, you've got the VAT returns, you've got to meet payroll, you're personally guaranteed, maybe even borrowing money. Even just starting a business is incredibly tough, and all the odds are stacked against you. The facts don't lie, most people foul. What is it that most successful business owners do? Well, I think they do these seven things. So let's get in to thing number one. On the flip chart here is the first tool, the first tactic that I use in growing my business. I'm running 17 different brands right now, so it's really important that I have amazing management information. And on a weekly basis, I wanna have dashboards, preferably on a daily basis. Now, I use a daily income sheet that produces my labor spend, my average customer value, and my income and customer count every single day across all my businesses. And I look at them, and all my senior management team, my supervisors, my deputy managers, my managers, understand those key numbers in the business. Now you also wanna be producing a monthly profit and loss. Business owners produce them quarterly or terribly. Most of them produce them annually and their accountant tells them how profitable they are. Remember, any long-term viewers of this channel, you tell your accountant how profitable you are and they're tax efficient for you. You should not be using your accountant as management information. In my opinion, if you wanna get really good, that stuff must be done in-house. If you're not doing it in-house, you ain't doing it enough. And my opinion is you should employ an accountant before you can afford it. Because if you get a good accountant in your business, they should be free and making you money by being more efficient on tax schemes that are coming out, grants, getting your energy bills down, and finding what other things you can do in your business. It's what big business does. And if small businesses did this, they would really, really go faster quicker. Now the second one, if you're running a big business and you've been in the game for a long time, you'll find that great entrepreneurs have brilliant lieutenants around them. Brilliant, effective management. And the word effective is the key word here. I use a little formula for this. It's called E plus M equals S. That's entrepreneurship plus management equals success. And we've got this six KPI rule. What are the KPIs that I'm tracking in my business? Now I've got some cultural KPIs and then some business KPIs. Let's look at the cultural ones first of all. I like to keep people in Formed. What's going on in the business? Give them the numbers. Tell them where you're going. Tell them the challenges you've got. When people know all that stuff and they're informed, they feel like they're part of a community. So that's the other one. You want to keep people in the clique, in the gang. Don't have separate little camps going on. That creates toxic behavior. And the third one is keep people inspired. You want to make sure people are inspired that they're working in the right place. See, if you just pay people loads of money and they're not inspired, eventually they get despondent and they leave. You have to manage them out. They're the cultural KPIs. Let's look at the business ones. You want to be creating a monthly profit and loss. So this is the dashboard and you want to be sharing it with all of the team so they understand the profitability of the business. If you're losing money, they rally around you to help you go forward. And if you're making money, then they know that they're working for a company that's going to be in the game for a long time. And when they feel secure, they want to stay with you and they want to push the business forward even more. That's what happens. The next one is standing, understanding your average customer value. Now listen, most businesses are just talking about their revenue growth, but actually the smart thing is drive your average customer value growth up because you've already acquired that customer, so you haven't got any marketing spend, and usually that's a much more profitable thing to do. So let's drive average customer value rather than worrying about driving revenue up because the faster the average customer value goes up, usually, usually the more profitable the business is. And then the third one, is understanding your labor, your staffing salary compared to your revenue. What is your revenue per employee? And work out the percentage of that and make sure it fits in with your industry standard because the biggest cost usually walks on two legs and we wanna be managing that cost. If you don't have effective, great management around you, you will burn out and you won't be able to do the big things, the big thinking about running a business. Someone's gotta be growing the business, that's the entrepreneur, the management are operating the business. When you 
get both in unison working together, it's a fireworks moment and you're off to the races. What tends to happen is organizations either get too much management and not enough entrepreneurship or too much entrepreneurship with no management and it all falls apart. You want to keep that level scale so someone's growing, someone's operating. Let's look at the third one. Audience. Any established entrepreneur that stays in the game knows the biggest tool in his toolkit is having an audience. What is an audience? Well, it's having a database of people that have bought from you before, keeping that database up to date, having a brand that people love, know, like, and trust, so that when you have something to sell, they're predetermined to buy from you. If you have predetermination, like Disney, like Apple, like Google, like an amazing small business in your area that people know, like, and trust, sales just keep coming to you. So building a database, creating content marketing, all of this that I'm creating here on YouTube, this amazing, well, I think it's amazing content, my podcasts, my books, they help me build an audience so that if I need to sell something, the audience is ready to buy because they've consumed so much content. And the great news is small business owners have more access and advantage of doing this than at any other time in history. Also, with an audience, you want to choose products and services where there's a hunger audience that are ready to buy. What does that mean? Say you own a football stadium or you are operating in a football stadium and you've got a hot dog cart in a football stadium and there's 70,000 fans there. Some of them are going to be hungry. Maybe all of them are going to be hungry and you've got a hot dog stand. There's a good chance that you're going to take a lot of money because of that hungry audience. What I tend to find is lots of businesses that fail, they don't have an audience they don't have a database, they produce no content, or they've chosen a sector where there just isn't a hungry audience. Maybe they're too early into the game or too late to the game. A good example of being a business that's too late to the game is selling fax machines in 2023. So make sure you're relevant and there's a hungry audience out there because that tool in your toolkit could make you very, very valuable. Number four is personal brand. And I still believe Hardly any business owners are taking advantage of this little puppy. So yes, there's personal brand for me that includes the stuff I'm doing here on YouTube, helping business owners grow their business. People join my Entrepreneurs University, listen to my podcast. People sponsor the channel or pay for me to speak at a conference. Yes, there's all that. But the real big win, the real big puppy is when people say, Hey James, I've watched your content. Would you like to buy my business? It puts me in a one horse race. It allows me to have an instant relationship with the person and they've reached out to me rather than me reach out to them. That's a big win. Also, it's an amazing recruitment tool. People that watch my videos say they're in the ice cream game or they're in the hospitality and leisure game. They've seen that I operate those businesses, they understand our business and they ask to come and work for us, saving hugely on recruitment fees. Having a personal brand has opened doors for my brick and mortar business faster than anything else that I've done because people know me, they know, like, and trust me, and it makes me Google famous. If you can be Google famous or even just famous to a few when people are typing in a certain thing to look for business products or services, that can really help you grow your business. It's one of the best tools that I've got in my toolkit. If you're not building personal brand, even in a small way, remember that famous to few thing, I believe you're missing out and you can get huge leverage on having a personal brand. Number five is having a tactic, a strategy for regular cash flow in your business. Now, this might seem absolutely obvious to you, but let's be honest, most businesses don't have regular cash flow. They have one big customer, one big revenue stream. They might be paying 90, 120 days after the product or service. If you've got to strangle on cash flow, eventually the marketplace will take you out by people that are bigger than you and more funded than you. So I've always tried to find ways of having regular cash flow into our business. Let me give you a quick example. We own a theme park. It's called Marsh Farm. It's an animal adventure park. And we've got that option where people just pay to come to us one or two times a year. But we created membership by direct debit. So you pay a little bit of money a lot of the time and you come more often. And that um, ease of residual income means that we haven't got all these peaks and troughs in the business. Why I like the childcare business and why I like wholesale businesses because we can predict what our customers are going to do and we can predict when we're going to get paid with all the millions of revenue that we're doing right now. If I ever have any anxious moments in my business, it's always around cash flow. People paying us late or we've got to fund CapEx projects or we're buying another company and that cash flow pressure whenever that happens 
does keep entrepreneurs and business owners up at night. So if you can have a position of residual income, you're going to squash that stress down and it'd be the best toolkit ever because when you're not stressed about cash flow, you can do much better things for your business. You can focus on the stuff that's very important, not urgent, that you can start thinking about really good stuff that will actually turn it into an excellent company rather than just an average or a good company. This is the thing that kills most entrepreneurs, keeping the cash flowing keeps the business going. So I'll say a big thank you to American Express for sponsoring this video. I've teamed up with Amex to make even more great content to help entrepreneurs and business owners grow their business. Now specifically, the one I wanna tell you about today is all about generating more cash flow into your business. I've popped it on the Amex UK YouTube channel. There's a link above my head on how you can go and watch that. Also a link in the video description. Generating cash flow is so important for business owners to stay in the game. That goes one step further than that because Amex have created the Business Trends and Insights Hub. It's a resource center online for entrepreneurs and business owners to grow their business. I'll put a link in the description for that. Let's get back to the video. Number six is reading is leading. Look, the harder you work on yourself, the better your business will be. And actually, I think lots of business owners work really hard on their business and completely forget themselves. I've worked really hard to sharpen my saw or sharpen my axe. So there's a brilliant book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And chapter seven is all about sharpening your saw. To do that, just go to a few seminars each year, read books all the time, consume really good podcasts. Check out my podcast, The Business Broadcast. I'll put a link in the uh, video description. That's absolutely free to do and you hear me coaching other business owners on how I would grow their business. Bring out episodes every week, completely free to do. But listening to that stuff and then putting that into action is going to make you better. And I don't think enough business owners focus on personal development. One of my favorite motivational speakers, Jim Rohn, who's sadly not with us, said this great quote, a education will make you a living, but a personal education will make you a fortune. The investment into books literally can change the game that you are um, achieving in your business. And most business owners, I speak to people running two, three, four million pound businesses that don't put any effort into going to seminars, reading books, listening to podcasts. They say, I don't have time because I'm running my business. But I'm thinking if you actually listen and read and do better stuff, you're going to get much better results in your business. You've got to make the time. You've got to make the time. 20 minutes a day, everything changes. Number seven, now this is the big one, slow pounds. And because I think people have to think longer term with slow pounds, and I'll explain what they are in a moment, they put off doing it. It's like exercise, you know? People think, well, I'm not gonna get immediate results. It's gonna take time to get results, so they put off doing it. Now, slow pound to me are property and assets that don't give you immediate return. Now, in the United Kingdom, if you buy a property in 10 years, as a rule of thumb, it's gone up significantly in value, and we usually say it's doubled in value within 10 years. But people buy it on year one, don't really see anything happen until the years trundle on. But if you do buy assets and hold them for a period of time, the compound interest, the compound growth starts to kick in. In my business, there's been plenty of hairy moments. At the back of my mind, I own lots of property and lots of assets, mainly commercial property these days. And if I get into a bit of hot water, I can use these to leverage off of them to get me back in the game. Because if you don't innovate, you evaporate. And I might have gone for a period where I'm not innovating enough to what my customers' desires are. And, you know, I've had a bad year. Year, something's gone wrong, but because I've got all these slow pounds, it allows me to re-leverage them and get back in the game or even sell some stuff off to get my business going again. So slow pounds are really important. I live by this little rule, 50-50 living. You should invest 50% of your profits into slow pounds each and every single year. If you do that after 10 years, you are going to have so much resilience, strength, and moats around your castle that will protect you. I started doing this at 18 years old. I didn't get big hands outs from parents. I was literally on my own. I left home very young. And so I made sure that I sacrificed a few years of my personal lifestyle so that I could live the rest of my life in complete comfort. And that's what you gotta do. You gotta save some money and start putting it into slow pound building assets. For me, that's property. Other people might buy Google shares and Disney shares and watch them grow slowly over a period of time. But you've gotta have a toolkit of slow pounds. If you don't have that, 
And also, when you've got this stuff, people have more confidence in you. Your team have security. They know that you've got all this stuff. So if you have a wobbly year, they know you've got all this stuff. It makes everyone feel a lot more calmer and it'll make you feel a lot more calmer. And if you're borrowing from the bank, it'll make them feel a lot more calmer. Now, I have got a bonus nugget. I did say there were seven, but I wanted to talk about this little one. This one is all about models. Some business models are just set themselves up, set themselves up for profitability much more than others. Now, I've had lots of businesses that from the outside, I thought, oh, I'll get involved in that. It must be a brilliant business. But then I've been trading it for a while and I've realized the model is just naff. It's a big pile of poo. Let me talk about one of them. I had a big indoor play center business. So I've actually got 10 indoor play centers at the time of making this video. The model for that is very fickle. If the weather's raining and it's cold, everyone comes and spends money with you. If it's super sunny and the kids are at school, no one spends money with you. And so I looked at the model and I thought, I cannot get customers to spend money with us when the weather isn't in my favor or the kids are at school. So I had this big box. And what I did was add childcare to it. And that really improved the model. It took it from a business that made just okay money into a model that makes excellent money. And that's what you've got to focus on. You've got to look at your business and think, can I improve my model for profitability? Now, there's a great business, one I'm a massive fan of called Costco. Now, they're based in America, Europe, and here in the United Kingdom. The reason they are so profitable is because they just have a fantastic model. Now, on the face of it, it's just retail. Why are they doing so much better than, say, a normal supermarket like Tesco's or Sainsbury's? What's really impressive about them, when you look at a big supermarket like a Walmart store, they've got 120,000 different SKUs. That's the individual lines that they're selling in their shops. Costco have reduced that down to 3,800. They also have big stores where they don't need loads and loads of racks. So they just put a pallet of goods out and people help themselves from the pallets. They've reduced their distribution costs. They usually sell out of their stock 12.4 times a year. Whereas you go to a Walmart store, it's only 5.4 times a year. That means they're actually selling all their stock before they actually have to pay for it. Can you understand that? That is just such a brilliant business model. So what you've got to do is look at your business and go, do you know what? Have I got the best possible model? Do I need to tweak my model? Let's look at the restaurant game. I've got some restaurants in all of our leisure and hospitality businesses. And we're trying to tweak the model so that we de-skill them, so that we don't need expensive extraction or fryers, um, which all cost money and pushes your insurance up. Is there any way that you can look at your model and say, if we just tweak this, our profits are going to completely go through the roof? Because you don't want to be in that position where you just survive. You actually want to thrive. One of the best ways of thriving is understanding understanding the model and working out what you can tweak to turn it into a commercially profitable enterprise that over time eventually works without you in it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments what sort of videos you'd like me to make. And if you've got anything that you want clarity on, hit them below. I'll do my very best to answer them. See you in the next one. If you would like to see me live at one of my seminars, you can book your tickets at jamessinclair.net. There's a link in the video description or on my website. See you there, gang.